All right, I've got just a few minutes, and what I wanted to do later this afternoon, for those of you who are interested, we're going to talk about our priorities for 2013. But there are a lot of new people to the landlord business. There are a lot of people who have not been a member of this association for very long, and there are some of you in the room who have been members a long time. However, it never hurts to review what has been done. I've been with you guys for 21 years, and one of the things that sort of irritates me every once in a while, I go to meetings and I hear landlords saying, gosh, when are we ever going to get anything done? When are we ever going to get any laws passed? You know, as your guy up there who, you know, worked himself to death to get some of this stuff done, that, you know, that gets my feathers ruffled just a bit. Uh, the very first bill that uh, you guys were involved in is a, a law that I hope some of you are using. I hope that you never need to use it, but if you do, I hope you do use it. It was Senate File 414 in 1992. It was called the Clear and Present Danger Law. Iowa was the first state in the United States to pass this law. And what it does, and those of you who knew uh, the late Elaine Zamoniak from Des Moines, how many knew Elaine? Several of you. And, you know, Elaine was a, a pretty much uh, known as a liberal Democrat. But she was the floor manager of this bill. And the reason she was the floor manager of this bill is that she had a very good friend who ran a, a housing project in Des Moines who had gone to Portland, Oregon and found out for a meeting and found out that the city of Portland had a clear and present danger ordinance. And she liked it. She came back and told Elaine about it. And the first rule you need to learn in politics is to get a lot done, you need to be friends with people. Like in every other area of life, you need to have friends. You can't have too many friends. And because of the fact that this individual was friends with Elaine, Elaine took a deep interest in this bill, much to the chagrin of some of her fellow Democrats. Um, what this bill does is that you can have an expedited eviction for people who assault uh, employees of yours, you or your employees, other residents, the threat of assault, illegal drugs, illegal firearms. And it's not just limited to that, but those are the ones listed in the code. And what you do is you give a three-day notice that the lease is over. It's not a three-day notice to cure like rent. It's a three-day notice that your lease is over. Does that mean they have to leave automatically? No, but usually if it's drugs, they'll get out of there. They don't want to go to court. So it usually can be pretty fast. But if it's going to be any point of contention, it's like any other lawsuit. If you go to court, you're going to need some witnesses. You might need a police report. You might need a policeman to come if there's such a file on this uh, incident. Or you might need some neighbors to show up. So you think about that when you decide to use clear and present danger. Where did Andrew go? Oh, you. Well, that's not it. There you go. Okay. Let's move to 1993 very quickly. Uh, this was a very big bill, Senate File 398. It started out with late fees. Uh, in the old days, you could charge maybe 50 cents or a dollar a day for late fees and be in violation of Iowa law. Late fees used to be a part of the usury law. So it was a very contentious thing. We had people going to court and losing over very, very modest amounts of late fees. So what we had to do is we had to convince the legislature that there should be late fees and that late fees should not be part of the usury law. So we got late fees out of the usury law, but the legislator said, okay, we understand what you're saying, but we don't want landlords just charging anything they want for late fees. You know, a lot of people would be good about it, but there would be always some people that take advantage of everything and would charge exorbitant amount for late fees. Uh, so we, we, we solved that issue. We, you'll see we'll come back to it later. Security deposits. Uh, until this law was passed, you could only get one month security deposit. One month's rent. This bill upped it to two. Now, the marketplace usually won't let you get two months rent for security deposit, but there are some cases where you may have somebody come make an application to live at your place. Their, their record's not real great, not what you would like, but you have this feeling you might, there's something about this person that has some redeeming value. You just feel like you want to take a chance. So in that case, you would charge two months rather than a month on a case-by-case -case basis. 
And this bill also had posting on notice allowed on eviction notices after three attempts at personal service. That was brand new. It had never been done before. All of this was in this bill. This bill almost got vetoed. And it almost got vetoed because of item number two. Uh, people raised quite, I mean, uh, some group got a letter writing campaign in and Governor Branstad was governor back then and, and uh, we had to do a lot of talking to make sure that he didn't veto that and he didn't. Because we convinced them that a lot of people would not be using that a lot, they don't. Yes, she did, Pat. Thank you. Yes, she was. All right, next, uh, Mark. Or, okay. This is the first bill that we started on the water issue. And we, you know, before Senate File 216, cities didn't have combined service accounts where they could put water, trash, and all these other things into just a one service account. And then we, item two of Senate File 216, water liens cannot be placed on landlord's property if a deposit is filed with a water utility. Now remember, all this is old law. The, the new law uh, we'll get to, hopefully, on, on this uh, water utility thing. And that passed in 1994. Okay, go ahead next. Senate File 2310. Offense and defense, when you're playing uh, the, the, the battle up the legislature, there was, a, there was a bill, Senate File 2310, and this is the bill, this is a, 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 we call this an anti-landlord bill. I don't remember all the provisions that were in it, but it wasn't all that great. But it did get watered down quite a bit in committee, and we had the House pretty geared up not to pass this anyway. But as it turned out, we just decided to work this as hard as we could. We thought we were going to lose in the Senate because they had control, the Democrats had control, we thought that they would pass this. But it's one of those things where some of our friends got up and made an argument against this bill, and the Republicans all locked up, and it was a pretty crushing defeat, 36 to 11. Those of you who know the legislature know that not many bills get defeated on the floor, because usually what happens is, is that they don't have enough votes to get to the floor, or number two, they've been amended, and deals have been worked out, and the bills will pass. But if they're not, if they usually don't have the votes to pass, they don't usually get called up. And this would have never been, this is one of those weird things where I don't think anybody thought this bill was going to fail, or they wouldn't have embarrassed the majority party guy that was running. It was his last year, too, in the legislature. It was, I almost felt sorry about it, but it did go down. Okay, it was the only bill defeated in 1994. That was pretty good defense. Okay, next. Small claims jurisdictional fees are raised to $3,000 on July 1 of 94 and to 4000 on July 1, 1995, and we were very active with other groups. A lot of the retail groups wanted this too, so we were involved in that. Next. Okay, 492. This is 1995. We talked about the late fees on rent. They're raised from just $3 a day, which was the very original bills, the most we could do in $40 a month. That was the original negotiation when they said, okay, we'll free you from the usury law, but we've got to have some kind of limit. And we tested it out a couple of years, and you guys came back to me and said, this is not working as well as we wanted it to. What can we do? And so the group decided, let's move it up to 10 bucks a day. We kept it at 40 bucks a month because the intent of this law is not to you know, have a, a super CD that, or a treasury bill that gives, gives you a lot of money. It's to try to make people pay their, their rent on time. And if they don't have the money, then they won't be paying this late fee either. You'll, those of you who come to the next session will be talking about uh, efforts to maybe adjust this item one more time in 2013. All right, the second part of House File 9492 dealt with the uh, notices. You know, the, the original landlord tenant law was a 30 day notice with 14 days to cure with lease violations and rule violations. And we convinced the legislature to change that to a seven days notice with the same seven days to cure. And I don't know how many states have it that fast. I mean, that, that's, pretty, that's a pretty dramatic change when you think about it. And the next item, the clear and present danger law provisions are extended to 1,000 feet beyond the landlord's property. And that idea actually came from some consumers who said they were tired of watching uh, these drug dealers not be on the landlord's property but be out in the street 
doing their drug deals. And so they came up with the idea that we ought to add it, you know, landlord's property and a thousand feet beyond. So we thought that was a good idea. So we took that idea and ran with it. And that got passed with 492. Next. And there's some more provision. This was a big bill. When I first started lobbying, and I've been lobbying long, well, several years before I started with you. I've been lobbying for 31 years. I've been 21 with you, but I've been 31 uh, altogether. And, and one group I've had for 31 years is the Manufactured Housing Association. And one thing they wanted to do in the old days, um, a judge, once you won the eviction, a judge could decide how long the holdover was. There was nothing in the code about how long that the judge could allow people to hold over. If the judge wanted them to hold over for a month, he could say, okay, they're going to stay another month. Uh, so years ago, and I can't remember what year it was, we, we uh, put the holdover at five days. And then I got to talking to you guys, and you said, that's too long. Let's make it longer. So the current law is still three days. Now that's the, no, I'm, I'm, I've jumped ahead of myself. Holdover's down below. This is just the, the notice that you got to get to the tenant before the hearing, the FED hearing. Uh, so that uh, used to be five. If you didn't get the notice to them five days before your court date, you had to start all over. You had to start, you had to reschedule. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. I've already talked about the holdover. Now that's 10 days, not five. Now it's three, it used to be 10. We started out with nothing, went to 10, and now we're down to three. I don't think we can get any faster, although I, I, I keep talking to landlords that want it right now, you know. I think three is pretty fast. I don't know of too many places in the country that have that. FED hearing, uh, the old law was 14 days, and even before then, it was whenever the judge said it was. I remember that. We, we came in, and we were the first groups that said, you know, we ought to have, you know, a little predictability. So we started out with 14 days, and uh, then you guys said, that's, that's too long. Let's get our hearings faster. And now it's, uh, now it's seven. And, and of course, it's, sometimes it's seven, and sometimes it's not. Those of you who live in jurisdictions where the funding for the judicial branch has suffered over the years, and uh, they, don't always, you know, they don't always have regular court times. I mean, if they do, it's maybe one day a week for FEDs. A lot of you probably run into that. And the courts have come back in from time to time trying to expand that. And as you'll know in the law today, you can either, there's, it's, it's moved from seven to eight days. Eight days is as fast as you can get a hearing. And then there's a 15-day option. And, and maybe I've heard some landlords say, you know, sometimes eight's even too fast for me for various reasons. And you can go in and say, I want a 15-day set up instead of an eight. Or the other side might ask for 15. But you get to veto that. If, if, if they offer, if they say, we want to do 15, you say, uh-uh, I want to do 8. If you do your procedure right, you get to do 8. So you can see four, 492 was loaded with a bunch of stuff. Next. Did we skip over anything? Okay. I just abruptly went to the next. Okay. 1996. Bankruptcy under under state provisions, 500 bucks in security deposits and other deposits are exempt from bankruptcy proceedings. How many people remember that one? That was our bill. Probably maybe with a little help. Well, with rental security deposits, that was just us. Okay, next. Uh, Senate File 70, uh, 2372, 1996. We redefine notice provisions. Notice can be personal service or certified mail. This is not the law today. This is the law that got us into trouble. This is the law that War Eagle overturned because uh, there was a provision in here that allowed you to give notice of court dates by certified mail. You didn't have to even do personal service. A lot of people didn't know that. I certainly didn't promote it very much because I. We did it, but I was—I didn't think it was, I didn't really think it was great, but we did it anyway. And that came back to haunt us. Sometimes, uh, sometimes the person can, sometimes you can get almost too greedy. You know, this this one was a little bit of a situation where we we should never would, you know, certified mail used to be pretty good in terms of how the 
Postal Service did it, but now it's not that great. There it is, War Eagle, which gave us our procedure today. All right, next. Okay, it dealt with the technicality uh, in non-payment of rent cases. Changed it, changed to the posting law. Two attempts at personal service instead of three. Both attempts at personal service may be made on the same day. Okay, the posting was three days instead of five. That was sort of becoming the same as that former law we talked about earlier. Next. Okay, we only got one bill passed in 1997. This has to do with knowingly presenting a bad check for rent can be considered uh, theft. If you knowingly give a landlord a bad check. Now the, the problem is getting your county attorney to actually do one of these. And I know we've had, what, two cases in Polk County? One or two where the county attorney has actually filed on this. But again, this is... Uh, Life is all about lobbying and uh, getting to know people. And I think if uh, you wanted your county attorney in your county to do some of these cases, you better get to know your county attorney a little bit because they get full discretion as to which cases they prosecute. Uh, somebody must have gotten to uh, John Sarcone in Polk County and persuaded him to do a couple cases on this. And, and I know he's done at least one or two. But you know, the benefit of something like this too is that you can put this in your lease. That you know, if you knowingly give me a bad check for rent, I will pursue uh, provisions under the law where this could be a crime. You know, you could use it as something that could be uh, maybe useful for you, whether the county attorney runs with it or not. Okay, next. All right, after having nine laws passed in six consecutive years, we didn't get any positive laws passed in 1998. Now, you must remember that getting laws passed is not, not that easy. The, those of you who have known me a long, time, a long time know that I usually give you ratios of how, what your odds are of getting a law passed based upon the number of potential laws or legislative bills introduced are. And your chance is usually about 1 in 10 or 1 in 12, just because there are so many proposals. There are lots of groups like yours around the state. There are hundreds of groups like you guys. And they all got ideas. And so, and then legislators sometimes have their own ideas. But you'll wind up in a typical session with 12 or 1,300 bills introduced, and it used to be 200 or 225 of those bills would pass. This last year is about 145. So it's getting harder and harder as time goes by. But we had nothing bad passed against us either. So that was any time you can get out of a legislative session with nothing bad happening to you, that's almost cause for celebration. Okay. Okay, 1999, we went back into action. Ah, House File 700, utility liens. You know, after that first bill passed, it, it just said that if a deposit was placed with the utility, then they, they wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't get a lien on there. But landlords didn't want to be start paying all the deposits. So this law said that you, you're not responsible for paying deposit or even seeing that it's paid in order to exempt your properties from liens. All right, next. You only have to keep the utility informed as to the name of the current tenant and the rental property. And we also, another su sweetheart deal was that utilities are given clear authority to withhold service to customers who have debt from a previous account. That wasn't clear in the code, but we thought, well, uh, utilities got to have some, some way of protecting themselves too. So we thought that was a good idea. All right, next. Here we go again, back with uh, notices and posting. You see some of these themes keep coming back, you know? We, we have these bills and then we try them out and sometimes uh, they're not working quite as good as we want, so we go back and try to fix them. Okay, we uh, get into 
cross-referencing chapter 4, which gets into how time is counted on notices. So that's in, we thought that would help the magistrates. Sometimes we think the magistrates might need a little help too, trying to figure out where it is you find that code section to count time. So we just cross-reference it into the landlord-tenant law. Notices which go to everybody, like when you're raising the rent or you're changing something in your guidelines or rules and regulations, all those can be posted or delivered to the landlord's or the tenant's unit. Something similar to that is uh, in today's law. Uh, it's almost the same thing. You, you certainly can go post that to everybody's door today, too. Next. Okay, more provisions. Certified mail. Uh, I, I don't know how many people really want to try this too much in court, but actually the way the law reads is chapter 618, certified mail is any mail for which you can get a receipt. It doesn't necessarily have to be what the U.S. Postal Service calls certified mail. Combined uh, FED money judgment, and we were also responsible for getting that law passed where you can, uh, can, can go for both at the same time under just one filing fee. So we wanted to make sure that uh, there's no confusion about the fact that you could take two attempts at personal service to deliver those, those two items. All right, next. Oh, well, this, is, this was a real, this is a real doozy here. This is, I remember this very well. This, the uh, cable TV people contacted me uh, years ago when this bill came in. And they, they told me what they wanted to do. They were talking about they were having trouble getting uh, landlords and other people uh, to work with them and get on, get on the property because, you know, your residents wanted cable service or telephone service and they were having problems. And so they had this, this idea. So I sent it out to a lot of our members and didn't hear anything. And... I'm like, I'm like legislator, so I don't hear anything. I think there's nothing really wrong with it. And I probably should have read it more thoroughly myself and probably should have known there was something wrong with it. But finally, uh, this bill passed one side, and it was about ready to pass the other side when one of our members finally read it thoroughly. And uh, we were very fortunate we stopped this bill. You, you don't usually stop the bill after it's passed one side and it's, on the calendar of the second side. It passed the Senate, sitting on the calendar in the House, already out of committee, ready to pass. And as, I, as my memory serves me, we were really lucky because there was a legislator that found some little grammatical error in the law and, and filed an amendment. And the amendment passed, and then it had to go back over to the other side. And that gave us time to get everybody whipped up. And, and this, was, this bill was really a nightmare. It was just... It, it would just pretty much let the utilities, uh, cable people, and the telephone people, if, if, I mean, they can make a real quick effort to work with you, and then all of a sudden, uh, if things weren't working out, they just get to do whatever they want to. And there are a lot of examples of, uh, of, uh, that I've heard since of where they'd come in and actually damage your property putting things in. Yeah, you've lived it, yeah. Yeah, well, I think you'd have a pretty good... Uh, I don't know what basis they think they're just doing that now. I mean, they don't have any, they don't have any protection. They know they need protection. They wouldn't have offered this bill. So there, there may be some legal things you could do. What they're doing now is they're calling for authority. They're having the tenant. They, you got to sign a release or give them verbal release over the phone. But I mean, are, are they are they not coming to you and trying to figure out where to put it in the, well, the service? They are. Yeah, that's what we want. We don't want them just coming without uh, talking to you. I've pulled up recently within the last couple of years and found issues on flat roofs and new roofs and without any kind of consent from me. I've had well, the dish stuff is controlled by the FTC. And there, there are some, some things you can deal with there, but it's, this is kind of a different deal than the dishes. This is just uh, cable, TV, and, and telephone stuff. Okay, next. We've got to keep moving here. Four laws in uh, 2000. 
This is rent control. And we, we, didn't, we didn't dream this up. There was a national group that wanted to uh, make sure that rent control was more difficult to get. And uh, so today, your city would not be able to have any kind of rent control on you guys at all because the state law prevents it. And the only way that this will ever change is that the, that the cities and counties or whoever wanted it would have to go in here and undo this law and then they could you know, do their own ordinance at a local level. But right now it's illegal for a city or a county to impose any kind of rent control on you guys. Okay, next. Okay, another uh, water utility bill. We just keep doing these things, don't we? If you register, you can register with the utility to get notification of a delinquent account by a tenant. Senate file 2253 provided that the notice must be given 30 days prior to the lien filing instead of uh, 10 days notice. Okay, next. Oh, this is, this is another wild bill here. Um, this, this just, you, sometimes you just get nightmares thinking about uh, the bills that can get through and you don't, sometimes you don't really know what the implication is. And I, this was late in the session one year, and I remember it might have been a Saturday morning or was it a Friday morning, but anyway, I'm, I'm up at the Capitol, I'm thumbing through a bunch of bills, and, and when they have an enrolled bill, it looks different. You know, you, and I'm just kind of looking at see what's passed, and I started reading this thing, and it, it started changing the term landlord. It got rid of the word landlord altogether. And, and you guys would have been property lessors. I mean, landlord's bad enough, but do you really want to be known as a property lessor? That sounds kind of <laughs> kinky or bad or something. But I tell you what, I, I had that in my hand, and, and I walked over to the, the lobbyist for the bar association. And I, I said, Jim, take a look at this. And God, his face just sort of started turning colors. He says, oh my God. What it meant was every, the bar association would have changed every form they have to change names. And, the, and the, it was the Status of Women Commission that wanted this bill. And Governor Vilsack was governor. And so what we decided, we, and we, we got to thinking, well, we can't have, the governor's not going to veto a bill from his own, one of his own commissions. You know, that'd be embarrassing. So what we decided to do is the governor went ahead and signed the, the bill, but the last bill of the session where you kind of clean up mistakes, this is we, can, we went right into the last bill of the session and, and took the sections out that we didn't like. I mean, there are other sections in their bill, but we took the sections we didn't like and got, it got fixed in the last bill of the session. So nobody knew it even passed. But it's just one of those real, you know, you think you're watching everything carefully, and, and most of the time we do a fairly good job, but sometimes that's why lobbyists have to help each other sometimes. So I think the Bar Association owes me one. <laughs> I mean, I almost didn't catch it, but I did catch it. Next, Andrew. Quick question on that. So we came down against that change? Yeah. Did oh, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah, we don't, well, we don't, we don't, if we want another name, we want to pick it. And, and we want... It, we want, that's the kind of thing where you would, there's a lot of legal precedent that deals with the word landlord. You'd be throwing out hundreds of years of legal precedent. That's, that's what the Bar Association was saying. I mean, it was a, dis they thought it was a, dis they, they thought it was a disaster. I mean, well, legally, I mean, you had to start new precedent again. I mean, there's a lot of good precedent in, in the law, so we don't want to really throw that out. That's the way they explained it to me. But, I mean, I thought it was kind of a, Nuisance, and they thought it was the end of the world. You should have seen them. They were, they were really upset about it. Okay. They still owe me. I think they haven't paid me back enough for that. Uh, okay, this is where we came in, where you can file money judgments and evictions at the same time with only one filing fee. And as time goes by, that gets more and more important. You know, when you go into small claims court, now it's now 85 bucks. So instead of paying 85 twice, you only pay. If you're going to do, if you're going to try for a money judgment, make sure you file it at the same time that you're filing your eviction action, so you can save your 85 bucks. What year was that? Oh, I don't remember now. I think I can probably look that up. Where were we before? 2000. Yeah. yeah. It, well, that was also 2000. The year 2000. Okay. The cases are not. We got into when we first said you could. 
file them at the same time, the courts kind of got screwed up and things were getting thrown out because well, you can't merge the cases because, you know, uh, rent's got three days and money judgment's got a 20-day answer period. So it just didn't sync right. And so we said, we don't care about that. We don't care. They don't have to be one case. We can have two separate cases. We just want to save the money. So that's, that's how we resolve that situation. We just were real honest. We, we don't care if they're two cases or one case. We just want to save our money. So everybody agreed with that. Two separate cases. Okay, 2509. I got two different numbers. I wonder what number it really is. That's what happens when you're in a hurry, I guess. Uh, it doesn't matter. Bill number doesn't matter now. Oh, this comes up about every five or ten years in the legislature. Uh, people want to know, well, what do you do with people's stuff after they leave? After, you, after they leave or after you evict them? What do you do with all their stuff? And all these lawyers want to, some of these small town lawyers particularly will call a legislator and say, what do we do with it? And then, and then somebody files a bill. You know, so let's, let's, and we don't want that. Any, the reason we don't want that is you're going to be better off putting it in your lease, what's going to happen when they leave their stuff. You, you, don't, you don't get any better in your own lease because you're in control of it. And I remember when the dry cleaning industry years ago wanted to deal with what do they do with people's stuff when they won't pick it up. They, they bring in something to be cleaned and, you know, a year goes by and they don't pick it up. They get tired of just messing with it. So after the legislature got through with that process, I talked to some of them and they said, I wish we hadn't even bothered because they just kind of made it worse. I don't know why a dry cleaner couldn't have a, a sales contract or a performance contract. You know, this is what's going to happen to your stuff if you don't come pick it up. Okay, next. Defensive year. Uh, you have now a 30-day 30, 30 notice provision. Yes, sir. Um, in the law right now, abandonment, is there any language? I thought it was, was there a law in what, right now for abandonment? Um, or is it what it is? The abandoned property? Are, are, uh, no. Where is it, Andrew? Yeah, you, don't you have to move it to a secure place for 30 days? Yeah, but what, you have to notify you, the tenant of where you've moved it. That's right. Well, I, I'm not, that's not coming to my memory. I'm, I, if, if, that, if that were the case, there'd be no need for an abandonment law. You have to notify them, you have to tell them you have the right to reclaim your property, but you will have charges to pay for the store. How many days do they have? Yeah, that's not landlord tenant. That's not landlord tenant. And you don't want that because that creates bailment. And that creates a responsibility on your part to make sure nothing happens to their stuff. That's the last thing in the world you want. What do you think, Mark? I, I, haven't, I haven't read into it for quite a while. I just so I, I thought know. it was in the lease with the I was Well, well it might it might it, 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 it can be in a lease. It can be in a lease, but I don't think it's in the law. It's not in our law. I don't think. Oh. Right, Pat? I don't think it is. When that, when that new uh, document came out with small claims court, there's a reference in there to abandon property. And I wondered what that related to. But I, I can't answer it either. But I, I was curious. Well, I don't, I don't think it's in 562.8. I may be in some other chapter, but I don't think it's in ours. It has something to do with abandon when they put utilities, when they take utilities down their name, put a landlord's name or something like that. That's considered abandonment. That's one thing. Okay. Well, we, in, in the manufactured housing law, we have abandonment. We have, we have abandonment defined, and we have procedures and all that. But we, I don't recall it in 562A. Now, this is a big deal right here. I don't, know how many, I don't know how many of you think this is a big deal. Maybe it's not a big deal. This is where, because a lot of you have longer leases, but what this means is, is that if you have somebody, let's, maybe you have an annual lease. Maybe the lease is going to end at the end of December. And here it is, the middle of November. Maybe that person has been paying rent fairly well, but maybe they're late most of the time. You have to chase it down. And maybe they've just been borderline, and you just don't want to do business with them anymore. What this means is, is right now, middle of November, you can give a 30-day non-renewal, and you don't have to give any reason whatsoever. Maybe you want to sell the property. 
You, it doesn't matter. You don't have to state anything. So uh, I think that's something that you guys probably want to retain. It's very flexible, but there are, you know, from time to time, this comes up in the legislature to always make you have a reason for everything. Yes? Uh, anything less than that, if we've got to give a reason, really it's taking our own just like the way. Yep. Because if you own your private property, you can do it and decide who's going to be on that property. Yeah, you ought to be able to decide. I, I just prefer not to do business with you anymore, Gary. I'm sorry. You may have been here 20 years, but uh, hey. Yeah, you give. Yeah, you give. A, when you sign a Section Eight contract, yeah, you can't do this. Yeah. No, you, you do not have to give a, a reason in Section Eight. Is my understanding. Well, I, your lease is up. I've already been there, and I'm sorry to do. Yeah, that's, that's been my understanding that uh, that you waive this if you want to do Section Eight. But you know that's your decision. You don't have to do Section Eight. You know. Okay, let's move. Do we need to get that documented too? Let's move next, Andrew. Next. Next slide. Do you want me to end exactly at four so we can get on the other stuff? Because I'll never get through all this anyway. I'm getting close. Well, pick it up. Well, I can't. We have too many questions. Okay, this bill would require everybody to install, maintain carbon dioxide alarms. Failure to do so could have resulted in a fine of between 250 and 1500 a little jail time maybe. Uh, then a fee program to run it. That, that's one, that just gives you an example of some of the stuff we have to combat every once in a while. Next, Andrew. One law in 2002, small claims court, jurisdictional fee went up to $5,000. Next, Andrew. We are moving now. Oh, One law passed, two stopped. Surcharge on a bad check went from 20 bucks to 30 bucks. Some of you still charging 20? Uh, the two stop would have uh, imposed a state energy code on rental housing requiring rental owners to retrofit their properties to meet the code. You like that one? Yeah. House file 407 would have increased punitive damage against landlords who kept rental deposits in bad faith. That one keeps coming up all the time. All right, next. I'm just giving you guys a flavor of what's been done in the past. Clear and present danger domestic assault cases. Uh, was allowed cities to add penalties and fines, lien provisions against landlords, 2106. This is one time where we decided that we didn't like raising the small claims jurisdictional amount. And the reason is, is that it would have been negative for landlords because when you get into cases that severe, you almost need uh, you know, a different style of presentation in court. You need witnesses, you need discovery, and uh, our friends at the Bar Association pretty much convinced us that we probably didn't want to be involved in doing that. Next. Back to that House file 4309. Yes. What, what? Go back, Andrew. Oh, there's right there. Well, that, that did change later. So, yeah, that, that's the problem going over history. Some, and there are some fines that can be done now. Okay, go, Andrew. Next. Okay, more defense. Um, $25 fine from cities, 1.5% per month fee. I think some fees got passed here, but we, we did put this in there that they have to send notice. I mean, it, there comes a time when you, uh, you know, you just can't get everything because there's some people, there are some people that maybe have earned some fines. So, you know, we have to be careful. Next. Okay, domestic violence again. This is a bad bill here. Uh, a phone call would be... Uh, set up a defense retaliation if you would take somebody to court over that that was not good okay next there was some question about the 30-day notice uh, in terms of what what length of lease you could use it for you know does 30 mean does 30 day notice means you can only use it for 30-day month-to-month leases or 
what. So we decided we wanted to say, clarify for sure that you can use a 30-day non-renewal of uh, any term. You know, you just have to remember, of course, when the term starts and ends. But it's not just for, a, a th because it's not just, sometimes you view, probably nobody in here has weekly renters, but if you had a weekly renter, I think it's like a seven-day notice. And then 30 was for month to month. And then people got to saying, well, what do we do for annual leases? What, do you, what kind of notice, non-renewal notice can you give for an annual lease? So we said 30. And so that's what, that's what got passed. What's that? If you, have a, if you have an annual lease, you just got to make sure that you give it 30 days or more prior to the end of the lease. So if, if, if you know by June, if you've got a yearly lease with somebody, if you know by June that you don't want them back the next January, you could give it to them in June. Say, I'm not doing business with you. You're not getting another lease from me. And you might say, well, why would you do that? Well, maybe once they know that they're not coming back, maybe they'll leave earlier. And somebody said, well, I don't know if I want to tell them that because maybe they'll trash my place. Well, if they don't pay the rent, you can get them out faster, yeah. see? And that may be another reason to do it because maybe they won't pay the rent. Um, this gets into garnishment. Uh, this comes up every once in a while, too. Uh, the length, uh, you know, the, the old 70 days is you had to refile, you know, every 70 days. Now, now it's 120. This next one, Section 2, was unbelievably tough. You won't believe how tough this was. I'm not going to name any names, but there's a certain landlord in Polk County who uh, got on the wrong side of a judge. And uh, this particular judge found a code section which seemed to say that, uh, Mark, that you couldn't go down, let's say, let's say you were in a corporation that owned the uh, rental properties, and that you couldn't go down there and represent the corporation. It had to be a lawyer. It couldn't be you or, or, or maybe your owner. Let's say you're not the owner. Maybe Gary's the owner. Gary could go as the owner, but he lives in California. And he wants you to do all that work. So this, this thing got to the point where we weren't sure how, how accessible the courts, small claim courts were going to be. And I mean, we're up there fighting the Attorney General's office. We're fought, fighting the Bar Association. But uh, we prevailed. That, that uh, small claims court is for is for the people. And uh, let's, let's don't get into these technicalities. It's worked that way for a long time, and so that was a huge deal. And then eminent domain passed in that year, which is a big deal, and uh, Governor Vilsack vetoed it, and then it got overturned. The that's rare for, for the legislature to overturn a governor's veto. I mean, it almost never happens in this state, but it did then. Next, we're at 4 o'clock. Maybe I should save the latter years for another time. Sure. You want to keep going? Yeah, yeah. All right, let's keep going. The people have spoken. Are we going to do priorities? We are. We, we won't okay. It won't take an hour. It won't take an hour. Uh, so our next speaker is not here yet either. Well, <laughs> hello, can't they find the Botanical Center? <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, sounds good. All right, I told you that we almost had a bill vetoed earlier in, in our, our history, and in 2007, we got one. And there was no rhyme or reason or sense for this one. This is the Cadillac version of the utility uh, lien bill. And this one is that you would have only had to register one time as a rental property, and then you would have been exempt from liens. You would not have to tell them every time a tenancy changed. And it, and it added everything, you know, from water, all the enterprise services. And we got that in 2012. We just did not get the one-time registration. But we do have more than just water now. And only one or two people voted against this out of 150 legislators. Nobody in the House voted against it. I think one or two senators, maybe the senators from Iowa City, voted against it because their city was kind of going bananas about it. And so they felt like they had to vote against it. And... Uh, Usually bills don't get vetoed when they pass. And the League of Cities claim they never asked for the veto, and I kind of happily believe them, because I'd be embarrassed to ask the governor to veto a bill as a lobbyist, and I, I'd only get two votes against it. 
I wouldn't even have the gall to do that because I'd figure the governor's staff would jump all over me. Like, you lazy. You didn't, you didn't get enough votes on the... They usually tell you, we'll consider a veto if you can get some votes on the board against it, you know, make it close. You know, do something. Don't, don't, don't let these bills come in here like this. They don't usually do it. There was somebody on the governor's staff that wanted it vetoed for some apparent political reason. I don't know what that was. But anyway, that was a, that was a devastating veto, I'll tell you. All right, next. Okay, we, keep, we were still tinkering around with uh, water utilities. <laughs> Seems like we never stop on that, do we? 2392, 30 business days now to notify the utility if there's been a tenancy change in order to prevent the filing of a lien. The old law was 10 business days. 30 business days, that's like six weeks. I mean, God, that's a long time. I guess if you're going to forget it, you might forget it that long, but sometimes it might occur to you that you haven't done that. All right, next. All right, now we get into this um, plumbing and electrical stuff. 2547 clarified, expanded the definition of routine maintenance so electrical work a property owner could do on rental property without having to hire a state licensed electrician. All right, next. 2009, we're getting close. Here are, the next year we got into the plumbing HVAC refrigeration systems where the, there's a definition of routine maintenance. Where are you? I'm either seeing things or Andrew. I'm seeing things or Andrew's going wild over there. <laughs> okay, 2010. Um, this is the the War Eagle thing, and I, I maybe Mark talked about all this this morning in terms of how you do notices. Did he talk about that at all? Okay, so you guys all know that by now. The next item was um, the State Building Code Commissioner adopted a um, provision that would allow sprinklers, or really require sprinklers, in the state building code. Now, most of you are not controlled by the state building code. You're con if you're a large, you're large enough town, you're controlled by your local building code. And the danger here was is that if the building code commissioner put a sprinkler mandate in the state building code for state buildings and factory built homes. This affected modular homes for sure because they control modular homes. Then the cities would say, okay, if it's good enough for the state building code, we ought to pass it locally. We ought to have one of these, in, we ought to have this in Burlington and Ames and, and, and uh, Council Bluffs. So we were working with the realtors and with the Iowa home builders on this. And what we were uh, able to do is to a Senate joint resolution, which is a mechanism where the legislature tells these agencies what they have to do, sometimes if they don't like what they're doing. So this passed, and it required that the uh, sprinklers had to be dropped. So there's, there are no mandatory sprinklers. Now, there are cities that, that doesn't mean cities can't do it on their own. A city can decide, and a lot of cities do. I don't think you're going to build a, an apartment in Des Moines without having a sprinkler system in it but it's, it's, it's a city ordinance. But you know, and in houses, I, I think most of these towns that have it, it's pretty big houses. It's six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 square feet before they mandate. And they say that's for uh, firefighter safety. When you get in structures that big, you pretty much need it. Okay, next, five bills. That's that old cable TV thing came back. Remember we had that once before? It was a lot easier this time. We were Johnny on the spot. We, 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 we were hammering that thing within the day. The ink was hardly dry before we were all over this bill this time. We learned our lesson from years before. 92, stopped this security deposit bill, which would have changed the legal standard for imposing punitive damage when security deposits were held illegally. This, this, this will come back. This is one of those bills that never quits, and it, it usually comes from our friends over in Johnson County and because there's just a whole history of uh, alleged uh, abuse of the poor students over there when they put down their security deposits. 